Number nine, a firm white and brown plaque on the scalp of an 80-year-old man. Well, the first thing I would like to point out to you is this is definitely an old person, an old, sun-damaged, fair-skinned adult, okay? An old white person. And as a hopefully future old white person, I say that with love and kindness because I have a lot of older uh, white relatives who have a ton of sun damage. And I see these kinds of patients all the time. When you have a patient who has extensive solar elastosis, for anyone junior watching this, that's elastosis. It's gray to blue elastic fibers that have formed a mat that have replaced the dermal collagen. Sometimes you'll have a little collagen in the papillary dermis, but all the pink reticular dermal collagen that should be here is gone. It's been pushed way down by years and years of sun damage. You don't get this by going to the beach on the weekends. You get this from every day, hours and hours of chronic full dose sun exposure for many decades, okay? Um, Look at the elastosis, and then suddenly it disappears. It gets wiped out. There's a little bit of it left. But there are areas where the elastosis is getting replaced by something else. So that's a clue when you're looking at a biopsy of someone with a lot of solar elastosis. If there's a zone where the elastosis is interrupted or replaced by, by collagen, that means it's new collagen. Collagen that was not there when the patient was born. Collagen that was placed there after the patient got old and sun damaged. And then you need to ask yourself, why? Why is the collagen there? Did they have surgery or biopsy and this is now scar? Do they have a tumor that's producing collagen or an invasive tumor making a reactive desmoplastic response? So that's an important clue when you have cases like this, is that the collagen is getting distorted by, I'm sorry, the elastosis is getting distorted by new collagen here and that's because it's being deposited in response to the tumor, okay? This tumor has, from low power, a couple of different areas. We have a hypercellular nodule down here. Then we have areas like this that are very pink and look almost scar-like or fibrotic, and an area here that's kind of a mixture of those patterns. So let's look closer. This area looks very much like fibrosis, these cells our plump spindle cells intervened by collagen. And in some areas, maybe a tiny bit of myxoid material, it gives it a kind of a bluish pink appearance. See, it's not, per there's perfect pink right here, but these areas are like a little bit more blue and that's because there's ground substance, hyaluronic acid mingled in with the collagen in the background. Very similar to me to the appearance you see in scar or granulation tissue. But as you look around, some of the cells are a bit larger and more hyperchromatic, like here. You begin to see mitoses, which of course you can have in scar. But in an older sun damage patient, if I see something that looks like a scar, I look carefully for significant hyperchromatic atypia. And I also want to know, do they have a reason to have a scar there? Or is this a lesion that's new and there's no trauma? You can't always get that information, unfortunately. So let me show you in the PowerPoint, I've got a couple pictures that are better. Here's an area, perfect area. Spindle cells with that kind of pink and pale blue background. And then look at this, a nodule of lymphocytes. This is the clue that you need. If it looks like scar and you see a little atypia and lymphocyte aggregates in an old sun damaged person, think of desmoplastic melanoma. Okay, the lymphocyte aggregates are the clue. They're, the lymphocytes know these cells are bad and they're homing in to try to attack them is the way I think of it. Here's a closer look and again, it has a very reactive appearance but there are some cells with pretty, pretty significant atypia, maybe mitotic activity here. All right, so that's desmoplastic melanoma. These are relatively uh, uncommon, a small subset of melanomas are desmoplastic. They're very important for dermatopathologists and other pathologists who see any amount of skin to know about because they are deceptively benign appearing sometimes. They can look very much like scar. They can also look very neural. They can look a lot like neurofibroma. I had someone once send me an email and say, I've got this 
kind of big neurofibroma on an old person's scalp, and it's got some nodules of lymphocytes, and I was like, you're describing desmoplastic melanoma. And then they went and looked it up, and they're like, oh, wow, you're right. And I was like, yeah, that, that story instantly tells me desmoplastic melanoma. Now, you can have neurofibromas on older sun-damaged people, and occasionally they can even have a little inflammation, but I'm always really cautious, especially if I have a superficial biopsy. I want to know how big is this lesion? What does it look like? Normally, neurofibromas clinically look like a neurofibroma or like a skin tag or like an intradermal nevus, soft, fleshy, usually polypoid or dome-shaped. Desmoplastic melanoma usually looks like a scar firm, and it may have some pigment or may have no pigment at all, depending on if it has a melanoma in situ component with it. About half of desmoplastic melanomas lack melanoma in situ. So that is difficult. If you find in situ, great. Then you've got extra proof of your diagnosis. If you don't, then you have to rely on morphology and immunohistochemistry. So the problem with desmoplastic melanoma is the main stains that will stain it are S100 and SOX10. The more specific melanocytic markers, MART1 and HMB45, are usually completely negative unless there is a component of more cellular, either spindle cell or a kind of epithelioid conventional melanoma. We'll talk about that in a minute. There are some other markers people have proposed, I think P75, um, there's also CD34, which can usually is more or less negative or only weakly positive here, but will be positive in neurofibromas. I have found though in the end that usually I have to look at the morphology and then confirm it with S100 or SOX10, okay? So, and I, I have some videos of, about this that go in, in great depth that you can check out on my YouTube channel if you want. So here we're lucky because we don't just have desmoplastic melanoma, we have areas like this that are very cellular and are composed of hyperchromatic atypical spindle cells with many mitotic figures, obvious malignant cytologic features, and they're arranged in kind of fascicles here streaming through the tissue. So when you see this, you're not going to think of scar or neurofibroma. You're going to look at that and think of spindle cell squame, spindle cell melanoma, maybe spindle cell angiosarcoma, atypical fibrosanthoma. It looks like a sarcoma, basically. So this is spindle cell melanoma. Now, this is a confusing but important difference. Desmoplastic melanoma is made up of spindle cells, but it's not the same as spindle cell melanoma. And this problem is, in the past, those two terms in the older literature were kind of treated as the same thing. And if, starting around 2004, Klaus Busam from Memorial Sloan Kettering and colleagues pointed out that if you're really distinct about how to define desmoplastic melanoma, that it sorts out differently from the more cellular, ugly, malignant looking spindle cell melanoma in terms of the way it behaves. And so anytime we can split out two areas that have a, a prognostic difference, that's, that's a worthwhile thing to do. So, the way to define desmoplastic melanoma is that you have atypical spindle cells, but they're divided by stroma, by collagen. The cells in general, they may occasionally touch each other, but most of them are not touching. They are spaced apart by collagen and you know, loose myxoid background. And when you have that picture right there, and 90% or more of the tumor looks like that, then that is a pure desmoplastic melanoma. And those tumors behave overall better on this, if you're looking at the same Breslow depth or Breslow thickness, pure desmoplastic behaves better than other types of melanoma of the same depth, okay? They have a tendency for local recurrence, but a lower tendency for distant metastases and lymph node metastases. So I've seen a desmoplastic melanoma grow through the skull all the way into the dura the patient was still alive, and the patient did not have metastases. That is a different tumor. Something about it is totally different and unique compared to other types of melanoma. Now, I have rarely seen metastases, and maybe Arno can speak to this more about how often, but I, I feel like I've seen one or two lymph node metastases, but rarely ever have I seen these patients with distant metastases. Well reported, but it just 
doesn't seem to happen, or at least I don't seem to get those specimens. How often have you seen distant metastases of pure desmoplastic melanoma, Arno? Uh, se several parts of the answer. You, uh, as described by, by Klaus Buza, if you have a, a pure type of uh, desmoplastic melanoma, you, you will not have. But uh, the history of the description of this entity is through metastasis, that's how it was recognized as a melanoma because sometimes there were metastases that had the classical version of a melanoma with the pigment that were coming from the uh, um, common melanoma uh, invasive part of the, of uh -huh. the tumor that you have. So it's uh, usually if you really have pure, so that's why if you, even if you recognize it's a desmoplastic melanoma, I would advise to do the melanoma and it should be 45, even if you know it's going to be negative, but you have to check it's negative and it can show you the in situ component or maybe a, a very uh, small invasive component that would give a different prognostic to the tumor. Excellent. Thank you for those comments. That's very helpful. Yeah, I, I take that. I have seen one case that I can recall that had a bone metastasis that looked just like desmoplastic melanoma, but the primary lesion looked like regular conventional epithelioid melanoma. So these tumors in the, the new WHO um, uh, skin um, tumor book has some really wonderful um, writing in there and particularly about the molecular background of nevi and melanoma. There's a lot of new data that's been put there and I found it to be a really wonderful resource. And one of the things they mention is that the, the mutational burden of all melanomas is really highest in desmoplastic melanoma because they almost always occur secondary to sun damage. I feel like the vast majority that I see are in the scalp or the face of elderly adults. I have also occasionally seen them arising from an acral melanoma precursor, but the majority of them are in, in the head and neck of elderly people that I've seen. So it's a good tumor to be aware of. And then when you have cellular spindle stuff that looks like sarcoma, then that is a spindle cell melanoma, okay? Because the terminology is confusing, I have a certain comments I add to my report to explain this because it is confusing historically. And I, I put that um, in, my, in my handout book, you can see. And also I cite in there Klaus Busam's paper and he has written many other things since, but I, I think that's a landmark work that's worth reading uh, to get familiar with this. So let's talk about spindle cell melanoma for a minute. One clue to the diagnosis here, morphologically, I mean, I always do immunostains in this setting unless there's obvious uh, conventional melanoma, but if it's purely spindled, I do immunostains to make sure that I sort it out from squamous cell carcinoma, atypical fibrosanthoma slash pleomorphic dermal sarcoma, and other, because the treatment and prognosis is very different for melanoma. The tendency to make fascicles is very strong in spindle cell melanoma, and those fascicles have a lot of overlap with nests. Look at this area here. These look like fascicles, but when you come down here, they begin to look almost like elongated nests, or like Dr. Sharon Weiss, one of my mentors in soft tissue pathology, she said they make packets. They are clumped together into little packages separated by stroma. And I like that. So it's kind of like melanocytes like to nest, right? Nevi nest and spindle melanomas have the same tendency to stick together with their colleagues, their partners, and make these. So that is one clue that helps me, all right? So, uh, and then you have other areas up here that kind of are like emerging between what looks like uh, desmoplastic melanoma in some areas, kind of merging into more cellular spindle cell melanoma where you're starting to make packets and nests, okay? And so in this case, I call this a combined uh, desmoplastic and spindle cell melanoma. It has both types. I would expect the prognosis of this to be worse, to behave more like a cellular spindle cell melanoma to have the potential for metastases. These tumors, unfortunately, are often diagnosed when they're really, really thick. They, the, the most cases I see, the tumor goes down into the subcutis or even to the galea aponeurotica or the periosteum of the skull because they clinically don't look um, like a classic malignant melanoma would most of the time, okay? They also have a strong tendency for perineural invasion. I can't remember, oh no, that's a vascular invasion here. See the vessel completely filled with melanoma. Maybe I put a picture in here. I can't remember. Uh, here, there's nerve right here. 
and then some tumor cells right in the middle of the nerve. So this nerve is kind of entrapped, but uh, so usually you'll see it tracking out away from the main mass. Very common in both spindle cell and desmoplastic melanoma to home in on those nerves. And oftentimes the nerves will be completely wrapped and filled up with the melanoma cells, so-called neurotropic uh, melanoma. Okay, so good to know about all of this stuff in the background is all melanoma, not fibrosis. I mean, there's fibrosis too, but it's all melanoma cells mingled in there. So uh, important entity. And I think this case had um, some in situ component at the top, if I recall. But uh, again, it, depending on which studies you read, about half of cases will not. Now, there's a lot of actinic keratosis, but I, I want to say there were areas that did have, by immunohistochemistry, some subtle melanoma in situ. But um, uh, I often see cases that do not because people will send them in to a sarcoma or spindle cell experts when they don't have in situ, you know, because those are the ones that are hard to recognize. I would also point out that spindle cell melanoma, the, um, whereas desmoplastic melanoma almost never has MART1 or HMB45 expression, spindle cell melanoma sometimes does, but not always. So the cellular spindle cell melanomas, they may sometimes show MART and HMB, but it tends to be more patchy. And I've seen many examples that were totally negative. And then people will often send those in and say, it's a malignant, looks like a sarcoma, S100 positive. Therefore, I think it's malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And I say, in the skin, on the scalp of an 80-year-old, no way. No, no, no. So we, that's a whole other lecture. And I've got like an hour-long video just about malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. On YouTube, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, put that on, you'll be asleep in no time. They MPNST, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, the spindle cell conventional type, usually is either negative for S100 and SOX10 or has weak or patchy positivity. It paradoxically loses its normal neural immunophenotype when it turns malignant, which is surprising. Epithelioid malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor is a different story. It will have strong S100 expression, but again, is a whole other topic for a different time. And uh, uh, even in patients with neurofibromatosis who have a tendency to develop malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, it almost never occurs in the skin unless it's coming from a deep soft tissue and pushing up. It has been reported, and I have seen, I think, one case of a primary small what I thought had to be malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor in the skin, but I would, I would just almost never be willing to diagnose that on the sun-damaged head and neck of an old person. That is melanoma, 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 unless you can prove it to me otherwise. Mm -hmm. So that's just uh, one caveat, and the reason I bring that up is I cannot count the number of times people have sent in cases convinced that it was a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor that was strongly S100 positive on the head and neck of an older adult. And it's always melanoma, okay? Please show additional cases. Fascinating presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Is PRAIM a useful tool for desmoplastic melanoma? You know, my understanding from what I've read so far is that PRAIM um, is not useful for desmoplastic melanoma most of the time, particularly for those the ones that really look very neural and bland. Um, so if you do prime and it's positive, well, that may be helpful, but I would expect that most of the time it will be negative, unfortunately. But maybe Arno can speak to that more. Have you found it helpful? I, I do not find it helpful. Um, it's usually very faintly or top heavy. Okay. I've, I've uh, only had uh, the lab I work in now I've, has Prem, but my former lab did not. So I've only been using Prem for about a year and a half. And desmoplastic melanomas are relatively uncommon. I only see them maybe... A, handful of times a year. So I don't have a lot of experience, but yeah, so far I've not seen one strongly positive. A few comments. Another, yes. Another clue I, I use is the, the presence of mastocytes in a mixoid background oh. uh, that I saw in your slide. And um, also I have called the pattern for the fascicles. I call it the short staircase pattern. Short staircase. Oh, I like that. It's like a little short staircase. I call them, I don't know if this joke will work in French, but I think they look like fascicles and nests, kind of a hybrid, so I call them nesticles. <laughs> and my residents laugh, and so if it's memorable for you, 
Um, but they look kind of like they want to be a nest and kind of like they want to be a fascicle. So nesticles, if you like. But I like short staircase. I'm going to start using that. That's great. By the way, I've loved your tweets and videos. Great stuff. I'm loving learning from you. This is wonderful. Oh, I'm, I'm curious. I'll ask you, Arno. Um, when you have an area like this, do you consider it desmoplastic or spindle cell? Because I wonder, once it starts making packets, how much is enough? And I don't know if I ever ha have a good answer. I have a, a very stringent definition for uh, spindle cell melanoma. It's usually, I would have all this desmoplastic melanoma and not reserve the spindle cell for really fully Very cellular. Yes. OK, so you would have called the whole thing desmoplastic? Yes. Oh, OK, that's good to know. Maybe I've been too uh, aggressive. Type of the area, but, uh, OK, that's good to know. All right. Thank you very much. That's very helpful.